guys, Mr. Klein here with our first of three lessons on our chapter on Newton's Laws of Motion. Sir Isaac Newton had three laws governing motion at its basic form, so we'll have three lessons. So let's get ahead and get started. Now, cats. You know, after all, the entire internet was actually created just for people to watch cat videos. So it makes no surprise that I'm opening up this video on Newton's first law of motion, talking about cats as they slide around on the floor trying to go get some food. Now, animals, of course, are very, very lovely, you know, like penguins who have soccer balls, uh, like riding soccer balls. You know, these animals right here, as cute and as awesome as it looks and things like that, they're actually showing a scientific principle that I want to go ahead and get into, and that is Newton's first law of motion. So let's go ahead and let's get started. At a basic level, the motion of all objects in the universe are governed uh, by three basic laws developed by English physicist Sir Isaac Newton in the 1600s. This right here is a picture of Sir Isaac Newton. He also invented calculus and uh, a lot of other things and considered one of the greatest scientists of our time. But nowadays, with scientists doing more and more research, with more and more observation because of more and more technology, we know that Newton's laws don't exactly govern all motion of all objects in all ways. So what we're learning here is actually just observable motion of what we call Newtonian mechanics. If you remember what we were talking about at the beginning when we were talking about motion, the study of motion is mechanics. So when we talk about Newtonian mechanics, we're talking about the motion of objects as described by Sir Isaac Newton. So that's on a middle school, sixth grade level. That's what we're going to be talking about. Now, Sir Isaac Newton's first law is as follows. Now, if you're watching this from another school district, you have a different textbook, you might have a different definition, but it kind of says the same thing. And this is the definition we're going with in this class, is that an object's motion will not change unless an unbalanced force acts upon it. Okay, so in other words, an object's in motion stay in moving, they stay in motion, an object sitting still or at rest will stay still or stay at rest unless something changing changes their motion or an outside force. In other words, objects keep on moving because nothing stops it. It's not going to stop on its own and something sitting at rest isn't going to just start moving on its own. Okay, so the computer or smartphone that you're watching this or tablet, it, it's not just going to just jump up and fly away. Like the only way it's going to do that is if an outside force does it. Like you just might throw it up in the air because you like throwing away money or something. So let's go ahead and let's look at an example right here. After all, this is Newton's law of motion kind of in a nutshell. What happens when the hamster stops running? Well, the wheel's still going, so it doesn't stop unless something stops it. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's create our graphic organizer. Now this graphic organizer will cover the whole screen, so make sure you uh, space this out appropriately. But we're gonna put our definition. Objects don't change their motion unless an outside force is applied to it. Remember, an object at rest will stay at rest, and an object in motion will stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force, more appropriately, an unbalanced force. And we'll talk more about what an unbalanced force is in our next lesson whenever we talk about Newton's second law. Uh, spoiler alert, force equals mass times acceleration. Okay, so let's talk about inertia. Uh, if you've watched the Bill Nye the Science Guy uh, introduction, you hear that inertia is a property of matter. And you're like, well, what exactly is inertia? Well, Newton's first law of motion is also called the law of inertia. So this is where that term has to do with Newton's first law. And so let's go ahead and let's define inertia. Inertia is the tendency of an object to resist its change in motion. In other words, the reason why an object stays at rest unless acted upon by an outside force or stays in motion unless acted upon by an outside force is because of inertia. It's a property of matter. Anything that has mass has inertia. Okay? And... It's a really simple concept in order to understand. So let me give you an example right here. So let's say you're riding in your car with your parents. Okay, when you're riding in the car, you're in motion. Okay, your parents are dutifully following the speed limit and they're going right around 100 kilometers per hour, or 55 miles per hour. Okay, your parents apply the brakes rapidly because some clown shoe just cuts out in front of them. When they slam on the brakes, you feel yourself push against the seatbelt. You go forward, but the seatbelt stops you. Why is that? Well, remember, that's because you're continuing to move because the brakes themselves are only slowing the car down. The brakes aren't slowing you down. You, you're, you don't have brakes attached to you. So you're still going at 100 kilometers per hour. 
Now, the reason why you slow to a stop is because the seatbelt, uh, which remember, you should always wear your seatbelts in your car, riding in a car, because the seatbelt is attached to the car that is slowing down. So because the seatbelt's attached to the car that is slowing down, it's the outside force that slows you down. Okay, this is why you need to wear a seatbelt, especially if you're a giraffe. Look at the head of the giraffe when it hits the wall. When it hits the wall, the head of the giraffe keeps on going. Okay, that's also why we have airbags. Whenever you have a car accident or something like that, you continue to move forward. The airbag pops out and slows you down, which we'll talk more about in our third lesson on Newton's third law. Whenever we talk about momentum and things like that. So let's go ahead and let's add some more to our graphic organizer. Why is there no change in motion? Well, there's no change in motion because of inertia. And remember, inertia is essentially the term that talks about matter's tendency to resist change, okay, unless an outside force is applied to it. So now we have that written down. Let's go ahead and let's talk about mass because I said that everything that has mass has inertia. Now, the amount of inertia an object has actually depends on the amount of mass that it has. In other words, the greater the mass, the greater the inertia, which means the greater the inertia, which means the greater the amount of an unbalanced force is needed to change that object's motion. Okay, so that's why being able to push something light is really easy, but pushing something really heavy requires a large amount of force. Okay, however, once you get a big object up and moving, like a train, for instance, okay, so it's hard to slow down. So that's why whenever we talk about freight trains and stuff and at railroad crossings, people say as soon as the guards go down, you don't go through it. The reason why is because a freight train has so much mass it takes a whole lot of outside force in order to slow it down, which means it takes longer for it to slow down. Okay, because of this, once an object is moving, like I said, other forces, no other force is required to keep it moving. Once the freight train starts going, okay, you don't need any other outside force to keep it going. It'll just go on on its own. And uh, which we'll talk about more in the lesson why this doesn't happen like here on planet Earth, but in outer space, if you throw something in outer space, it's going to keep on going because no outside forces for our purposes are acting upon it. Okay. And so this is what we're talking about. More mass, the more outside forces need to stop it. And apparently that stop, that little door stop at the end of the water slide isn't enough to stop this larger force with more mass. <clears throat> anyway. Let's go ahead and let's fill out the rest of this. Objects don't change motion unless an outside of force is applied. Why? Because of inertia. Now, what affects the amount of inertia? The amount of mass. The more mass, the more inertia an object has. The less mass, the less inertia it has, which means the more susceptible or easier it is for an outside force to change its state of motion. Okay? So... The concept related to Newton's first law of motion, what we a lot of times talk about is friction. When you roll a ball on the floor, okay, you roll the ball, it keeps on rolling, and it comes to a stop eventually, okay? Why does it stop? Well, according to Newton's first law, it's because an outside force acts upon it, okay? But what outside force was it? Well, you know, as you get more and more into physics and engineering, you know, there's a whole lot of dynamic and static forces working on the object and slowing down, but we're going to boil it down to a simple kind of frame framework of outside forces. And the one that slowed down was the most is the one which we're going to talk about, which is friction. Friction is the force that opposes motion between two objects when they touch. Okay, the classic example your teacher has you do is rub your hands together really quick. Okay, when they're rubbing against each other and they're touching, friction is happening. F the reason why friction occurs is actually because no object is perfectly smooth. At the molecular level, the they're not the atoms and molecules aren't laid out perfectly straight. There's little jags and edges. And so what happens is when two objects rub against each other, these edges catch each other, okay? And so when they catch, it kind of slows it down. The most common effect of friction, okay? Like you probably rubbed your hands whenever I was talking about that. And you know when you rub your hands together, it's because your hands are cold and you want to warm them up. The most common effect of friction is heat, okay? It's the molecules from the objects bump into each other as they move. Thermal energy is uh, the, the motion, the mechanical energy transfers into thermal energy, which we'll talk about in our next chapter when we talk about energy transformations. So there's an example of friction, okay? These two objects are actually spinning and they're touching. Well, guess what happens as they spin? You see the sparks 
and you see the heat is released. This is actually friction-based welding, okay? So once they stop spinning, they start slowing down. It slows down, the heat goes away, and the two parts are actually welded together, okay? So just to watch again, the two objects are spinning. When they touch, okay, friction occurs, okay, the edges are bouncing against each other, and as they continue to push in each other, heat is generated, and they actually weld together. The molecules actually get caught between each other, and it forms a single object. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's put this in entire second uh, column of information. What is a common outside force? Well, it's friction. And what is the main by byproduct of friction? Friction is heat. Okay, so let's go ahead and let's go put this down. You're probably going to want to pause it right here. And there we go. Let's talk about the wrap up this lesson by talking about types of friction. There's four main types of friction that you need to know about. And we're going to look at them each individually. The first one is static friction. Static friction acts on objects when they rest on a surface. Okay, it's what keeps things from sliding around at rest. A good example is when you sit in a chair. You're probably sitting in a chair right now. Without static friction, you'd slip right out, okay? It, so gravity kind of pulls you down, and what other forces keep you from moving or things like that is actually the static friction that holds you in place. You know, you could just be like that guy, okay? The static friction failed after he slipped back too much, okay? So that's static friction, okay? So let's, uh, let's go ahead, and we can also call it standing friction also. Uh, so what are the types of friction? Well, there's standing or static friction. The next one is sliding friction. Sliding friction acts on objects when they slide across a surface. It's kind of in the name. It's much weaker than standing friction. Standing friction is actually of the four main types of friction that we talk about in this lesson. Standing friction or static friction is the uh, strongest of the four. Sliding friction is much weaker than standing friction, which is why it's easier to slide something on a floor uh, once they start moving, you know, it takes some effort to get a box to start moving across the floor. But once you get it going, it's pretty easy to go because it's easier to overcome the sliding friction. Uh, but sometimes sliding friction can be pretty strong. Good job there, buddy. Uh, as you can see, the sliding friction, he starts to slide and the sliding friction brought him to a stop and caused him to face plant. Okay, so we have standing or static friction. Static meaning staying in place. Okay, and we have sliding friction. The third type is rolling friction. See, I know you're kind of wondering, well, what exactly is rolling friction? Well, rolling friction acts on objects when they're <clears throat> rolling across the surface. It's the weakest of the forms of friction, okay? A good example is when wheels on a car roll on the road. As the, what it is, is it's essentially sliding friction, but it's on a wheel. So like as the surface of the wheel touches the road, it continually moves because the wheel is in motion. Okay. And so that's why you have like tires burning out on a car. What you have right here is actually rolling friction. The wheels turn and as they make contact, they produce friction because they're spinning so fast, but they're not moving. Okay. You create all the smoke because of all the heat being generated. Okay. So... We have static friction, we have sliding friction, we have rolling friction, and finally the fourth type is fluid friction. Fluid friction acts on an object, on objects that are moving through a fluid, okay? A fluid, of course, being a liquid or a gas. Fluid friction that occurs in the air is what we call air resistance, okay? As an engineer, I worked a lot with air resistance and that you want airplanes to stay up in the air and you want them to be more efficient at flying by reducing the air resistance. Now, you feel fluid friction when you wave your hand through water or through the air on a windy day, okay? If you're riding in the car, I know you've done this. It's a spring or summer day. Your parents roll down the windows and you pull your hand out and you're kind of flying it like an airplane. When you lift up your hand, suddenly your, hand, your arm goes flying back. The reason why is because there's more surface facing the wind. There's more air resistance, which pushes you back. Now, what I'm going to show you, don't try this at home, but this is fluid friction in action. So we have a pistol being shot underwater. If you've seen a Mythbusters ex episode, you've totally seen this. Okay, As the pistol fires around, look how far... The bullet goes. The, the bullet goes before it stops. It's because the fluid, the water, is so much thicker than air, it slows it down because the water molecules can't get out of the way. And as a result, the bullet bumps into them, friction takes place, and it slows down. And by the way, that big poof is actually the gases of the propellant of the bullet uh, from the gun being fired. So there you go. That's fluid friction. 
Okay, and let's go ahead and put that in our graphic organizer and let's wrap up this lesson. Newton's first law of motion says that objects in motion stay in motion and objects at rest stay at rest unless acted upon by an outside force. Why is there no change? Why, why don't objects slow to a stop or move on independently? It's because of a property of matter that we call inertia. And the main thing, inertia is re directly related to mass. In other words, the more mass there is, the more inertia an object has, which means it's harder to change its motion. Now, what's the most common outside force? Well, it's friction. And that's when two objects rub against each other. The main byproduct of friction, of course, is heat. And there's four types of friction. The first is standing or static friction. And that's the friction of two objects just sitting on top of each other. Sliding friction is the friction of objects sliding on top of each other. Rolling friction involves things that roll across the ground. And fluid friction involves friction that involves objects moving through a fluid like water or air. So there you go. That's your lesson on Newton's first law of motion. Hope you enjoyed it. And if as always, if you have any questions, please let me know. And thanks for watching.